Once upon a time, in a teeny tiny village up north in England, it was around 11 p.m. on the 13th of April in the year 1699. Little nine-year-old Jane Roth woke up from her first sleep and rubbed her eyes, trying to make sense of the moody evening shadows. Her mom, Mrs. Roth, hopped out of bed and headed straight to the fireplace. Just then, out of nowhere, two dudes popped up by the window and hollered at her to get ready for an adventure. According to Jane's later testimony in court, it seemed like her mom was expecting these mysterious visitors. She willingly went with them, but not before whispering to Jane, Stay put, kiddo. I'll be back in the morning. Maybe her mom had some secret night mission, or maybe she was in some kind of trouble and knew leaving the house was risky business. Either way, Jane's mom never kept her promise. She never returned home. That night, something awful happened. Mrs. Roth was attacked and passed away. The crime was never solved. Fast forward almost 300 years to the early 1990s. A history enthusiast, Roger Eckerk, strolled into the public record office in London. Among the ancient vellum papers and manuscripts, Eckerk stumbled upon Jane's testimony. But there was something fishy about it that caught his attention. Originally, Eckerk was researching a book about the history of nighttime. He was knee-deep in records spanning from the Middle Ages to the Industrial Revolution. He dreaded writing the sleep chapter, thinking it would be as boring as watching paint dry. I mean, sleep is just a necessary part of life, right? He was skeptical that he'd find anything interesting. But as he dove into Jane's criminal deposition, two words jumped out at him. First sleep. These words held a hint of something tantalizingly peculiar about life in the 17th century that Eckerk had never come across before. Now here's where things get interesting. If there's a first sleep, that means there's gotta be a second sleep too? Like splitting the night into two halves? Is this some quirky family thing, or is there more to it? Well, Eckerch went on a wild goose chase through the archives for months, and guess what? He found loads of references to this mysterious double sleeping phenomenon, or as he later dubbed it, biphasic sleep. All right, let's time travel to see how people caught their Zs. Picture this. It's around 9 to 11 in the evening. If you were lucky enough to afford it, you'd flop onto a mattress stuffed with all sorts of interesting things like straw or rags. Fancy folks might even have feathers in there. But hey, if you were at the bottom of the social ladder, you'd have to make do with heather or even the bare earth floor. Yikes. Most people slept together in one big slumber party. Bed bugs, fleas, lice, family members, friends, servants, you name it. They were all snuggled up together. And if you were traveling, well, you might even find yourself cozying up with a total stranger. Sleeping used to be a whole production, with all these crazy rules and positions. Like, girls would be on one side of the bed with the oldest closest to the wall, followed by the parents, then the boys, and finally any random people who happened to be crashing there. Can you imagine trying to get comfortable with all those restrictions? Anyway, a few hours into the night, people would start waking up naturally. No alarms or anything, just their bodies deciding it was time to be awake. This period was called the watch, and it was pretty productive. People would do all sorts of things under the dim moonlight and oil lamps. Peasants would use this time to get back to work. They'd check on their animals or do chores around the house. One servant even brewed drinks for her boss in the middle of the night. And of course, you had your troublemakers lurking around causing mischief. After a couple of hours awake, people would go back to bed. This morning sleep could last until dawn or even later. Just like today, when you finally wake up for good depends on when you hit the hay. This biphasic sleep thing was a worldwide phenomenon in the pre-industrial era. It was popular in France and Italy. Eckerk even discovered evidence of this sleep habit in far-flung places like Africa, South and Southeast Asia, Australia, South America, and the Middle East. Back in the medieval era, the rich folks were living it up in their fancy houses with their extravagant beds. These beds were like works of art, adorned with all sorts of decorations and made with the softest feather beds and luxurious linen sheets. They were the centerpiece of any grand house, and the noblemen even had their symbols embroidered on the hangings. Not only were these beds super comfy, but they were also the perfect spot to gather for a chat or entertain guests while showing off their fancy textiles. Now, Let's take a look at 14th or 15th century France. You'll see a bed fit for a king, complete with a canopy and curtains. The pillow is covered by a headsheet, which eventually got replaced by pillowcases. Fun fact, 
Back then, a pillowcase was called a pillow bearer. But enough about that, let's get back to the beds. In those days, they didn't have those four-poster beds with poles at each corner like we see in movies. Instead, they had hangings draped from a frame suspended from the ceiling beams. Sometimes, there was even a tall bedhead and a fancy canopy called a tester or cellure. The actual bedstead was its own separate structure, surrounded by all this opulence. Some beds were so high that they even had a trundle bed underneath for a personal valet or maid. Beds and bedding were so valuable that they were passed down through generations. You'd find them mentioned in wills from as early as the 14th century. A well-to-do family might pass on one feather bed and bolster, while the wealthiest folks left behind multiple beds with expensive hangings and top-notch bedding. Even woolen mattresses were considered important enough to be bequeathed to family members. Now, let's talk about the beds in places like monasteries and almshouses. They were pretty simple, with just a mattress, blanket, coverlet, and plain pillow. In 1487, a generous soul even left money to provide sheets for the old folks' beds. They estimated that each bed would cost 13 shillings and sixpence. Peasants also saw some improvements in their sleeping arrangements by the mid-15th century. They were raised off the floor and had a few more comforts, like three boards for a bed, a sheet, and pillows. Sure, they might have had some worn coverlets and canvas covers, but it was a step up. By the time Queen Elizabeth I took the throne, not much had changed in the way beds were arranged. Except for the fancy four-posters in wealthy homes and a few inns, things remained pretty familiar. The head sheet disappeared, but people were still all about their cozy bedding. As the middle classes started to thrive, they too wanted feather beds and soft sheets. In fact, around 1580, a clergyman named William Harrison complained about the younger generation's obsession with feathers and pillows. Back in his day, if a man could afford a mattress and a sack of chaff to rest his head on after seven years of marriage, he considered himself as well off as a lord. Pillows were only for sick women, and servants were lucky if they had a sheet over them to keep the straw from poking their tough hides. By the way, in the Tudor days, which is partly medieval too, people had a similar sleep routine. They would split their sleep into two parts, but their sleeping positions were totally wacky compared to what we do today. Sleeping flat on your back was a big no-no because it was associated with passing away. So instead, these folks would snooze in a half upright position. Oh, how times have changed. Now we can't even imagine sleeping without our comfy beds, fluffy pillows, and soft sheets. But it's always fascinating to look back at how people used to snooze in the good old days. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.